Welcome back to Echo Ridge and another episode here in our Ultimate Beginner's Guide. Today we have a couple of objectives. One, we need to start handling all this carbon dioxide. And two, we need to do some exploring. Because while we're sitting pretty on water right now, this water is not going to last forever. Especially when we switch off of these oxygen diffusers that are currently providing all of our oxygen now and start using the electrolyzer, because the electrolyzer drinks water at a pretty good rate. Speaking of which, we're going to start knocking out that research now, because while we may not be building an oxygen machine today, the time is coming when we're going to have to do that. For now though, we still have 28 tons worth of algae, and plenty more where that came from, so I'm not in too big of a hurry. But one thing about your playthroughs is you always need to be looking into the future. Hence the reason we need to start exploring a little bit. Now because of the digging over here, we've sort of revealed a lot of this area over here. Because the duplicates have a sort of vision, and despite this being solid abyssalite, the closer the dupes get to it, the more of the map reveals itself to us. For instance, if I ask the dupes to put in some ladders up here, it will reveal more of the map over here. I'm also going to have them start digging up over here for the same exact reason because it'll reveal more of the map this way. And by doing this, you're going to be able to uncover a lot of the map before you even leave your starting biome here. And this is important because we're going to be keeping our eyes out for any vents and geysers that we may want to tap into for its resources. As an example of that, we found this cool salt sluss geyser and this cool sluss geyser conveniently located not too far from our starting biome. And what's great about these two geysers is they provide water. Although we're going to have to clean it up a bit before we can use it because the cool salt sluss geyser erupts with brine water and it's at minus 10 degrees and the cool sluss geyser erupts with polluted water and it's also at minus 10 degrees. In the bottom part of our base we've discovered a natural gas geyser and this is great because we might be able to use some of this natural gas and put it into a natural gas generator. And that'll help the colony in a couple ways. One, it'll provide more power, providing 200 watts more than the coal generators that we are using right now. But it also provides another reoccurring source of water in the form of polluted water. Below our base, we found a cool steam vent that erupts with steam that we could cool down and get even more water from. So far though, that's all we've really been able to find. And while I want to do more exploring, before I do that, it's probably a good idea to put the duplicates in Atmo suits. Atmo suits are going to protect the duplicates from all the nasty environments, such as the chlorine or hydrogen atmospheres, which will cause the duplicates to have eye irritation, or these cold environments that can cause the duplicates to get hypothermia. Because while duplicates are in their suits, it gives them extra thermal protection, and because the duplicates are in their suits, they won't be getting that major eye irritation. The other benefit is the Atmo suits are loaded up with oxygen. So we're going to start researching these now, and that way when the duplicates are digging through these nasty environments, they're not going to have to keep coming back down here to breathe the oxygen because their suits will be fully loaded. Now before you install the Atmo suits, you're usually going to have a better oxygen system than say just a pair of oxygen diffusers but there's nothing prevents you from installing one of those systems now. We're probably going to wait until our oxygen system is a lot more robust, but I still wanted to let you know that there was nothing wrong with installing them right now. We're also going to be keeping our eyes on the printing pods for some more duplicates. While right now I'm pretty happy with the six that we have in the colony, the fact that we're going to be venturing further and further away from the core part of our base is normally an indication that you're going to need a little bit more labor because the duplicates are going to be spending more of their time traveling from point A to point B and less of their time actually working. I also wanted to clarify something from a previous episode that has raised some questions, and that's the fact that the duplicates are picking up this polluted dirt and dropping it down through this automatic dispenser. And what happens when we do that, I'll queue up a sweep of the polluted dirt now, and not that Catalina is going to be a great example of this, but before they hit the sink, you can see that Catalina has a bunch of germs because they picked up the polluted dirt. But as they wash their hands at the sink, they get clean. At this point, it's kind of in their pocket. But when they drop it back off at the automatic dispenser, you can see both the automatic dispenser and Catalina have all those germs back on them. 
This isn't too big of a deal, and I'll show you why. Because we have disinfection on, this automatic dispenser now has a cleaning errand queued up. So a duplicate's gonna come over here and actually disinfect the automatic dispenser. In this case, it happened to be the same Catalina. And now there are zero germs on it. But also, at the end of a duplicate's workday, as indicated in our schedule, when they go from work to downtime, they always go to the bathroom. And when they go to the bathroom, they're then gonna have to pass the sinks and wash their hands, which is gonna take all those germs away. Now, during the workday, if they happen to be harvesting some mealwood, the meal lice would end up having food poisoning germs and be thrown into the refrigerator. But because the duplicants aren't allowed to eat meal lice, and all of the meal lice is actually being made into pickled meal, all the germs are then killed there. So despite the food poisoning germs transferring everywhere, the duplicants aren't really at a risk of getting food poisoning while they eat because of when they're washing their hands, the disinfecting, and the fact that we're cooking all of our food anyways. Now, it's more than likely that if this was a real colony of mine and not one that I was sort of using for instruction, I wouldn't have done this system this way. And if I did, I'd probably still put a sink in place to save the duplicants the errand of disinfecting the automatic dispenser and anything else that particular duplicate ended up touching before they went and washed their hands. I'd also try to find a critter that could eat all the polluted dirt for us. And that way the duplicants wouldn't have to move the polluted dirt around the base anyways. Lots of different ways to skin that pip. This is just the way we chose to do it this time. Now to deal with all this carbon dioxide. If we go to our gas overlay, it really emphasizes the fact that there is carbon dioxide everywhere. And it was okay for a little while because we were using this giant pit as a carbon dioxide sink. And all that meant is we were just going to make sure that the carbon dioxide had a place to go, and that way our duplicants didn't have to work in it, because that would cause some issues considering they can't breathe it. But because of the addition of the coal generators, the carbon dioxide is starting to climb higher and higher. And if you don't deal with it, eventually it would cause some major problems. That is where the carbon skimmer is going to come into play. The carbon skimmer requires one kilo of water per second and 120 watts, but for that, it's going to get rid of 300 grams of carbon dioxide per second. And because it's giving us one kilo of polluted water back, it's a water neutral process. Now as to where to install the carbon skimmer, we have a couple of options. A lot of folks would put it right here next to the coal generator, and this would work out pretty well. The coal generators are producing the carbon dioxide, the carbon skimmer would clean it. But if we did that, all the carbon dioxide down here would still just be sitting here. So instead, it might be a good idea to put the carbon skimmer here. For the purposes of learning more about auction not included, we're actually going to install them in both places using two different methods. You may remember that we had some water here. We've managed to pitcher pump it all away so we can get rid of this pitcher pump. And then we can put a couple of fresh tiles right here. That way we have some place to actually put our carbon skimmer. In adding another building, we have to make sure that we're keeping an eye on our power grid. As a reminder, the carbon skimmer requires 120 watts, so we're going to be adding more of a load onto this one wire. You can see that our potential load is up over 1900 watts, but our current load is hovering between 3 and 600. So I think we still have a little bit more room on this power grid to run the carbon skimmer. What I like to do when I'm installing a new building that requires power and I'm a little concerned about the power grid, I take a look around my colony and check and see if there's anything that's using power that I really don't need it to. In this case, I know the oxygen diffusers aren't going to be on for very much longer and they are both asking for 120 watts. So when they come off this grid, it'll make me feel even better about putting the carbon skimmer system on the same line. Now, the first system that we're going to be using is going to incorporate another water sieve. For the purposes of the video, I'm going to put another one right next to it so you can see the prototypical system that a lot of players use. With that being said, I normally wouldn't build this water sieve here for the simple reason that we already have one right here and it's sort of conveniently located. But I'm going to set it up anyways and then just remove it. And the reason why we're doing this is remember the carbon skimmer takes in regular water and produces polluted water at a one-to-one -one ratio. So we can quite literally take the polluted water, put it right into the water sieve, and then when the water sieve cleans it, take that water and put it right back inside the carbon skimmer. And then all we really have to do is 
charge it with a pipe of our own water that we already have available. In this case, I will bridge it on just like this. Now, the only thing we have to make sure is that we don't overfill the system. So we're going to use our handy dandy pliers here, disconnect it right there, and then we can deconstruct the liquid bridge. And that is sort of it. The carbon skimmer is now cleaning 300 grams worth of carbon dioxide per second. It's taking in all the fresh clean water and outputting the polluted water right into the water sieve, which is turning it right back into clean water. So the only thing now required to get rid of all the carbon dioxide in the game forever is a little bit of sand to keep the water sieve going with the filtration medium and 240 watts worth of power. But I don't love this system in this instance because, well, we have another water sieve right up here. But I don't necessarily think this is always the perfect system. And there's a specific reason why. This polluted water can be very valuable. And to show you why, I'm going to have to put down an exosuit forge. We're not necessarily going to use it right now, but there's something in here that I need to highlight for you. And that has to do with the atmosuits themselves. If we select an atmosuit here, you can see that it requires 300 kilos worth of refined metal and two units of reed fiber. Additionally, you can see that there's a repair atmosuit button. And it's because the atmosuits that you build can wear out sometimes quite quickly depending on your difficulty setting. And when they need to be repaired, they require yet another reed fiber. Well, like, oh, that's not a big deal. We put in a couple of thimble reeds here. And look at this. We already have four reed fiber here and four reed fiber here. I'd love to tell you that this is going to be enough reed fiber for the entirety of your playthrough. Unfortunately, it won't be. This is just going to help supplement your reed fiber because you're also eventually going to want to start putting carpeted tiles down and carpeted tiles also require reed fiber. Not to mention, when you start putting paintings down, they also require reed fiber. And that's why I like this next system a little bit better, at least for the purposes of this playthrough. I'm going to start off by putting a couple of mess tiles here, and then a bunch of hydroponic farms. And we're going to put one carbon skimmer down, and also a liquid pump. We're going to have to extend our power line, bringing it all the way down here to the carbon skimmer, and the pump and then the output from the carbon skimmer is going to go all through the hydroponic farms and we're also going to connect it into this liquid pump and as many of you have probably already guessed we're going to plant a bunch of thimble reed seeds in these tiles extend our clean water supply all the way down to our carbon skimmer and now we are quite literally turning all this polluted water and all of this carbon dioxide into reed fiber now a couple notes on this system first Right now it is using a 50-50 split. And what I mean by that is half the water is coming in from the liquid pump and half the water is coming in from the carbon skimmer. This isn't too big of a deal, but we might be able to make this system a little bit more efficient by adding a bridge. And what this will do is tell the pipes to only use this polluted water whenever this line is empty or not filled. And as you can see, the carbon skimmer is getting 100% throughput first, and then whenever a little extra water is needed, it is provided from the polluted water pool itself. Another note, and it's sort of specific to this biome right here, is you're going to have to keep an eye on the temps. Thimble reed can only grow with a maximum body temperature of 37 degrees. Right now, it's 33.9. When this cool steam vent starts to erupt, it's going to be putting a bunch of 110 degree steam into the atmosphere, and since there's no abyssalite barrier here, as you can see, it got sort of cut off when the map generation put the cool steam vent in. It will eventually heat up this polluted water, and it may get to a point where the thimble reeds would be stifled because it was too warm. When that happens, though, we can just extend the polluted water lines and maybe put the thimble reeds up here where it's much cooler. Something else we could do is as we're clearing out more slime biomes like this one here, and we get access to all of its polluted water, we could dump it right back into this biome and turn all of that polluted water into thimble reed as well. Now, to be fair, you're probably not going to want to do this on every map that you roll, because sometimes the polluted water might be better served by turning it all into clean water. But in this case, as we showed in the beginning of the episode, we have found a cool salt slush geyser and a cool slush geyser, so we're going to have all the water we ever need. And lucky for us, the pod finally gave us a duplicate worth their salt. 
This stinky here has an interest in ranching and has a plus nine to husbandry. They also have green thumb, which makes them a little bit better at farming. Their negative is one of the best negatives in the game because they're a kitchen menace. Because while, yeah, they're not very good at cooking, the food they do eat ends up making the stinky happier because they can't tell good food from bad food. And this stinky is a great addition to the colony because they're going to be able to help our bubbles out with all the new ranching requirements. So as the standard, we'll make sure we put stinky into farming and ranching with the priority being ranching. Not that they'll be able to do it yet, because they're going to need to earn another skill point. But for now, they can at least help out with the farming. Another shorter and more focused episode, I know, but we've learned a couple of valuable lessons here. First, we saw a couple of different methods for being able to deal with all this carbon dioxide, but we also gave some thought about looking forward into your colony. In this case, through exploration, we realized we had enough water. We also realized we're going to have to start building Atmo suits soon. So instead of wasting all the polluted water that the carbon skimmer creates, we decided to turn it into reed fiber. The next episode in the series is definitely going to be heading towards creating that oxygen system. That way we can make sure that our duplicates have plenty of fresh oxygen to breathe and we can get rid of these oxygen diffusers and end our reliance on algae. So until next time, happy gaming and I'll talk to you soon.